Hey everyone, I'm Lee here along with my co-host Nathan, and this is Means of Creation, a show all about the future of work and the online passion economy. The show is made by Every A Writers Collective focused on business writing, and this is another episode of our new Web3 Explainer series. Today, we're going to tackle a pretty ambitious subject, which is explaining how Ethereum works and what it is. I think it's safe to say that after Bitcoin and Satoshi, Ethereum and Vitalik Buterin are probably the best contenders to be the household names that most people associate with crypto. But I think the number of people in the world who actually fundamentally understand what Ethereum is or how it works is probably quite small. So to help us unpack those subjects, we've brought in a guest today who not only has a grasp on how Ethereum works, but she was actually part of the team at Coinbase that helps launch Ethereum. So we're really excited to welcome Preeti Kasaretti on the show today. She is an entrepreneur, writer, engineer, and educator. She started her crypto career as a software engineer at Coinbase before deciding to start her own crypto company called True Story, where she and her team built their own blockchain on Cosmos. Today, she runs a popular course that introduces students to the Ethereum ecosystem and helps them build their first Web3 product in just 21 days. In my opinion, she's also written the best primer on Ethereum on her blog called How Does Ethereum Work Anyway? It was one of the first blog posts that I read that really helped me to understand Ethereum. And so I think she's perfect for helping us unpack and explain Ethereum today. So let's dive in. Welcome, Preeti. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. Awesome. I'm super excited. Amazing. Okay, so let's just dive straight in. Would love to hear your explainer on what is Ethereum and how does it work? (laughs) Uh, Okay, so I mean, obviously, that's a very, very broad topic. So I think we should kind of break that down. And to start at a very high level, like what is Ethereum? I mean, it's a blockchain, just like Bitcoin is a blockchain. Um, Solana is a blockchain. Avalanche is a blockchain. So at a very high level, it's a blockchain. But what makes Ethereum unique as a blockchain, or made it unique in the beginning at least, because um, the only blockchain that existed before Ethereum was Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And what Ethereum really did was they created a blockchain, which is basically just a database. You can think of it as like a database that keeps track of transactions that happen publicly. So let's say I want to send you $5 or five Ethereum, that all of that transaction data is stored on the blockchain in this public database. And so there's no centralized authority that's keeping track of this database. Instead, the authenticity of the database, meaning like making sure that the transactions are valid, is just done in a completely decentralized way. And we'll get into how that works, I guess, later in the podcast. But really what Ethereum did was it created a blockchain where not only can you send money, like, you know, Bitcoin, you can send money. And so Bitcoin really innovated there. Now with Ethereum, you can also do all other types of transactions besides just payments. You can create applications where a transaction might be that you're posting a message onto an application, or a transaction might be that you are adding two numbers, you're subtracting two numbers in order to do something larger. So basically it created this blockchain that could be, that's general purpose and can be used for much more than just simple payment transfers. And that's really the innovation of of Ethereum. And how it does that is sort of super interesting, in my opinion. Um, And we'll get into that hopefully soon. Got it. Okay, so so this is really interesting. So basically, Ethereum was this more general purpose blockchain where it was not just a ledger for sending and receiving payments um, like Bitcoin was, where you sent and received Bitcoin and everyone has a Bitcoin balance. But instead, Ethereum is this um, basically like computing platform where developers are writing applications that would it be accurate to say that they are stored on the Ethereum network? And so they're yes. essentially like verifiable and publicly accessible and viewable, and no one can tamper with those applications. That's right. Exactly. So it's, it is a general purpose computing platform, exactly like you said. And so really what Ethereum did is whatever you can do in a regular computer technically you should be able to do on Ethereum. Mm -hmm. So they built this programming language called Solidity, which really compiles down to EVM bytecode. But Solidity is a programming language where you can write programs, just like you can write a Python program or a JavaScript program to maybe code a front end or a back end. Similarly, now you can write any type of program that you can do on a regular computer, but you're um, running that program on Ethereum instead. And so 
yeah, so, so Ethereum gives you this programming language called Solidity, which um, is what you use to write smart contracts. And smart contracts are nothing but some, some piece of code that defines some logic that you want um, running on the blockchain. And then you deploy the smart contract on Ethereum, and then Ethereum runs that smart contract. So in that way, you can basically do anything that you can do on a regular computer on Ethereum. Yeah, it's, it's so cool because like, it kind of blew my mind when, when I wrapped my head around it that it's like it's almost like open source in the sense that you know anyone can freely take the code that someone publishes as open source and run it, but it sort of extends that idea almost to like the state of the program itself because the database of the Ethereum network of like what are all the things that people have in their wallets, yes. like in the whole history of that is like a shared open state. And so it's funny because people call it it's, it's decentralized because no one controls it, but it's kind of in a weird way more centralized because everyone can work on like one shared history, which is really <laughs> rather than like everyone having their own databases with their own history that nobody can trust each other necessarily that theirs is like the, the correct history or something like that. That's right. And then the concept that you're referring to is typically called composability in mm -hmm. the Ethereum world. To kind of break down what you said, basically what you're saying is in addition to writing, taking um, the actual code, you actually also store the data of every application on the Ethereum blockchain. So the Ethereum blockchain stores smart contract code and it stores the data that's associated with all the accounts on the Ethereum blockchain. So you can literally take anyone's Ethereum account, paste it into Etherscan or any kind of public blockchain API scanner and get like user balances, what types of transactions they've made. All of that data is completely public and available for you and is stored on the blockchain. And so because that's possible, um, because all the state is public and all the smart contracts are public, anyone can build on top of it. They can copy the code. They can build on top of it. They can do whatever they want with it. So it's completely permissionless in that way. In that, you know, previously in like the current Web2 world, if Microsoft deploys some piece of code, developers can't really build on it unless they open source it. But even if they open source it, they, they have to fork it and then they have to probably have, um, like you said, the data is not there. It's just right. the code. Whereas like with Ethereum, all the data is there so you can build on top of it, which just creates really, really cool uh, use cases. Yep. Yeah. People often talk about um, Ethereum and the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. Can you unpack what that is and what does it mean when other blockchains are also EVM compatible? Yeah, what, what does all of that mean? <laughs> yeah, so EVM stands for Ethereum Virtual Machine. And basically, this is the, so when you write still your code in Solidity, and then you, you create a smart contract, right? And when someone interacts with that smart contract, some, something has to run that code, something has to process that logic that, that you're running. And so the EVM is what actually processes the, the logic that exists in smart contracts, or any kind of transaction. So every transaction is basically processed by the EVM. And the EVM has a set of rules for how different things are done. And it has its own language, um, which is the Solidity language, but it's compiled down to a machine language um, that the EVM can understand. So when you write Solidity code, that code gets compiled to bytecode and the EVM understands bytecode. And so whenever someone interacts with the smart contract and executes certain logic, that logic is converted to bytecode and then the EVM executes that bytecode to be able to process that logic. There's been a lot of criticism about the EVM because it was designed very fast. It's, very, it's a very crude machine. It's not like an optimized EVM and it's really hard. And because you know, with the blockchain, once you deploy it, it's really hard to make upgrades. It's not something that people have been able to improve unlike the Java VM, for example. So um, the Ethereum EVM is very simplistic. It has certain operators that it could do, but it could be a lot better. Um, but what happened was the industry kind of standardized on the EVM because Ethereum was really the first blockchain that allowed for general purpose computing. And it became really, really popular really, really fast. And so everyone started writing EVM programs, um, basically smart contracts in Solidity. And as a result, because so many people are writing EVM programs, some people who are building new blockchains, for example, like Avalanche, they realize that it's really hard to compete with the EVM because it's so many developers already know Solidity. There's best practices that exist for Solidity. And there's auditors that understand how to audit Solidity code. To rebuild that entire ecosystem is really, really, really hard. So some blockchains realize that 
And they're like, okay, the EVM seems like to be the elephant in the room. So we should be EVM compatible. Mm -hmm. And basically what that means is that you can write a pro, uh, a smart contract in solidity and compile and it get compiled down to the EVM bytecode. And that blockchain will understand the EVM bytecode and be able to execute it. So basically it's a way to, for something like Avalanche to, to piggyback off of the adoption and the ecosystem that has been built around EVM rather than building it from scratch. For example, yeah. with Solana, you have to build it from scratch because they're not EVM compatible. Totally. It's kind of like with web browsers where like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, these are all standards. If you want to build a new web browser, you can totally do that. And you just have to, to be able to take in as an input the standard HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that developers have been writing for you know decades and render it properly in a way that the sort of developer would expect, similar to other browsers. And then you can compete on something else, like maybe my browser is really privacy focused or my browser is native like Ethereum wallet integration or whatever. So there's like different twists you can take on it. And so I'm sure some of these other blockchains, maybe they're faster or cheaper or whatever, you know, um, than it, or more for so they can kind of embrace and extend as the strategy goes. Actually, I'm curious, do they do that where it's like, you can run your Ethereum code here, but like also or Ethereum code. I'm sure that's not a phrase anyone actually uses, but do they do that where it's like, you can run your Ethereum code here, but you can also kind of enhance it with extra stuff that you can't do on Ethereum. Like, is that a strategy? They definitely do. Um, and then also, for example, something like Avalanche, you could write Solidity code and port it over, or you could just write in whatever language they provide for their smart contracts. So you can kind of mix and match. Maybe you want to port some of your application over and then build on top of it. Um, um, so yeah, they do allow kind of enhancements that way, but at a bare minimum, they allow at least you to port over your EVM application. And that's, it's a very smart move in my opinion, because then it's so much easier for a developer to just be like, okay, I'm going to exist on this chain and this chain and this chain, because it, I don't have to rewrite the logic. But just to be clear that that breaks composability with other applications on Ethereum, right? If someone were to take their application and port it over to Avalanche, even though it's EVM compatible, it doesn't compose with all of the rest of the world of Ethereum L1 applications? That's right, yeah. Um, until we have better cross blockchain communication, which we're not even close to having, like we don't have the ability to communicate more complex transactions across different blockchains. Yeah, we lose composability. So that application that existed on that exists on Ethereum can still be composable with other apps on Ethereum, but the app on Avalanche doesn't have that ability. That's right. Hmm. Makes sense. One thing I wanted to ask about was, I think, you know, when most people think of Ethereum, probably the first thing that comes to mind is like NFTs and DAOs. And till now in the conversation, we've talked a lot about the technical capabilities of Ethereum as compared to like Bitcoin potentially. But yeah. How do those give rise to NFTs and DAOs? You know, like what's the connection between Ethereum being a programmable, you know, Turing complete virtual machine and the ability to, because it seems like an NFT is kind of the same thing as a Bitcoin in some ways, because it's just like a token. Basically, it doesn't feel like a program that I'm running. It just feels like a token that is one of a kind as opposed to one of many. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, NFTs are a super simple concept. Like you said, it's just, just like an ERC-20 token is just, an ERC-20 fungible token. ERC-721 is just a different type of token. The key difference is that, like, okay, so Ethereum, the blockchain, has the Ether as the underlying token, right? Um, and you use Ether, for example, to pay gas fees, or if you want to just store by Ethereum itself, you can buy it. But because Ethereum also allows us to build smart contracts, um, Things like ERC-20 and ERC-721 tokens um, are actually just smart contracts that define what type of token it is. So it's not like native to the Ethereum blockchain. These tokens are not native to the Ethereum blockchain. They're just smart contracts that define a set of standards for what this type of token is. The, the reason we can't really do this on Bitcoin, at least not before things like stacks and stuff existed on the, on the core blockchain, is because just deploying any kind of smart contract on Bitcoin is is really, really painful. Um, and it really doesn't allow for complex logic. So with Ethereum, we can kind of innovate a lot faster and create new types of tokens that were just never possible before. So the reason they exist on Ethereum is mostly because we can write smart contracts and we can define the logic of that specific type of token using a smart contract. And so yeah, ERC-721 tokens are honestly, they're just very simple. Like any junior dev can take the standard that exists and deploy a contract and there you go, they have an ERC-721 token. Okay, so for a lot of folks who 
are new to crypto. I think upon hearing all of this, this might sound like very intellectually interesting, but the question that might pop up is like, why? Why why invent like a new kind of computer? Um, why build applications in this way using smart contracts versus just in the traditional software development way on your own server and database? People oftentimes say that Ethereum applications are like normal applications, but slower and more expensive and they cost money to use and deploy. And so could you sort of paint the picture of like, what are the benefits to developing applications in this way? And what are your your responses to folks who are skeptical? Yeah, I think a few different, you can kind of look at this from a few different angles. Um, one is like we talked about the composability that it creates. So everything on the Ethereum blockchain is open, it's publicly verifiable, other people can build on it. And so it allows people applications to be composable. And an example of where that really shined, where that property really shined is DeFi. So everyone saw how quickly kind of DeFi grew in 2020 and 2021. And the main reason is because of how composable a lot of these applications are and will continue to be, especially now DeFi 2.0, a lot of developers are thinking about composability. So what this allows um, is much faster innovation, in my opinion. When you open source everything and everything um, allows for permissionless innovation, we, the, the rate of innovation is just so much faster. Like the, the, the amount of stuff that have been invented in DeFi in the last couple of years is remarkable compared to how quickly the same thing happened in traditional finance. Mm -hmm. Like it probably would have taken one or two decades to do the same thing. So speed of innovation is one. Two is, um, I think people sometimes underestimate the importance of um, not needing permission to have access to applications, whether it's financial, social, or something else. In, in a country like the US, maybe it's less appreciated, but some other countries do really appreciate that permissionless ability to access um, any kind of application. And I think you're also starting to see that in the US where you're starting to see platform sensor users, um, kick them off for no reason. And I think that's a very slippery slope. And Balaji talks about this a lot, where he says um, in Web 2, like that kind of censorship is a slippery slope. But in Web 3, it leads to a crypto cliff, as he calls it, meaning that um, when you when you try to when you kick off a very valuable user off a platform because they said something wrong or thought something wrong, um, people who don't disagree with that will have a very strong voice because they have skin in the game in that protocol. They actually can can cause the, the network value to go really low if they decide that this platform is not something they want to be attached with and they move their um, activity elsewhere. So in crypto, because every network participant has skin in the game, it creates more, um, what's the right word? More accountability for platforms to not just censor people left and right. Um, Besides that, I think like the other argument that I really like for why crypto, why Web3 um, kind of falls in the line of what Chris Dixon talks about, which is the, the value of being able to own and port your data. Mm -hmm. So like we said, all of the data that exists on the Ethereum blockchain is open. And technically you own your data because the only person who has access to your Ethereum account private key is you. And so the only person, so you technically have access to all your data. Um, there's no other person in the world that has your private key. We see in Web2 that when we use Twitter, when we use Facebook, like we don't have access to that data. Like it's completely owned by Facebook and they monetize it and they do all kinds of things um, to that don't align with the users, the end users at the end of the day. Whereas with Ethereum, because you own the data, um, you have a lot more power and control over what you can do with that data, what the platform can do with that data. You can move to different platforms, for example, rather than rather than one single Twitter existing, maybe there's a way that um, three different Twitters exist for different things and they use the same underlying data that's stored on the blockchain. Like that was never possible before because before all the data was siloed in all these companies. Now we have all the data on this publicly verified, verifiable database, it's called a blockchain, and then all the applications can exist using that same data that you own. So I think that's very powerful. Um, I don't think we've seen that play out though. Like most of the applications today in crypto are very much about like, how much money can you make? Like how fast can you flip this token or this token? I mean, there are very genuine people in the yeah. space building really, really cool things, but 
on the surface, at least with a lot of NFTs and DeFi, that's what it seems like. And I think, I think that will slowly over time become less of a thing and it'll, we'll start to see more and more utility to the average user. Agreed. Yeah, I think there's like a, a really powerful, like ideological and mission um, underpinning to Ethereum. And at least like a, a lot of what drew me to the space from many years of investing in Web2 was the idea of user ownership of their data. Um, and I think a lot of people in the world um, kind of just take the status quo for granted. Like this is the way that the world has always worked. But I think yeah. when you reflect on it and introspect and as I did for like many um, years, really, like I, I think it becomes apparent that a lot of the issues that we have on the modern internet with these platforms is rooted in the fact that users don't actually own anything. Um, they don't own their social graphs. They don't own their content. Um, they're not able to monetize it freely however they see fit. They're really beholden to the policies and um, the experience that that one platform has decided upon because they have a database that is closed off and that engenders like very strong network effects for their particular company. So anyways, the implications are, are very profound um, as to like what happens when that isn't the case um, and all of this data is on one public shared um, open database. But I think like, as you said, we're, we're still in the very early innings of exploring what kinds of new experiences can be built when that is the case. Yes. And I know that like some people argue that, you know, it's too early has been used for too long, but I think crypto is like, I, when, you know, even when I got in deeper into the space, 2016, 2017 timeframe, um, when people would ask me like, what do you think is, how long do you think this whole thing will take to play out? Like, I thought it was like two to five decades. Hmm. So even though it might seem like it's been a long time, it really hasn't, especially because it's not like we're fixing one small part of some technical stack. Like we're rewriting um, like how the financial industry works, how the internet operates. Like that's not going to happen overnight. I think it's going to happen over like a decade or two decades more before we actually see us become like truly crypto native. Yeah. It's, it seems like the way that a lot of it's unfolding is similar to how most technologies unfold, which is there's like waves of yeah. an adjacent possibility. And whatever is currently the next possible step is determined by the technology we have, the ideas that are in people's heads and the motivations that, that people have um, and, and the behaviors that users are currently doing. And I'm curious, like, it seems like sort of the the steps for crypto's expansion so far are like unfolding maybe we're like okay first there's like the idea of a blockchain and and money right and then there's the idea of a programmable blockchain which gives rise to the idea of you know non-fungible tokens and uh it seems like the next thing that's kind of come around is organizations DAOs, right which i think yeah. DAO might be a little bit of a misnomer it's more like an on-chain organization it doesn't necessarily have to be super decentralized you can have leadership programmed into your smart contract whatever you want anyway what do y'all think are the next sort of like adjacent possible things that are interesting to you that feel like it might be more ready for bigger levels of adoption yeah it's a good question and like it's almost like you know the 27 ico boom like yeah, 99% of the ICOs were crazy ideas and way out there. But when you actually look at them, I think a lot of them were just bad timing. But many of them were actually good ideas. Um, so I think like all of the interest, like all of the crazy things that ICOs thought about, like blockchain for healthcare, blockchain for the oil industry, blockchain for this, blockchain for that. I actually think that some of them, a lot of them will happen. Um, but those are like industries that are super entrenched, super slow, super hard to change. And you need to get many, many stakeholders in the system to agree to do something like that. And the stakes are really high. Like people don't want to risk their health by using an experimental technology. Like that's just not something they're willing to do. So right now we're kind of using magic internet money and DeFi to experiment. But I do think once the technology reaches maturity, It'll go to more serious industries. Um, I do think social networks are probably on the fringe of happening on the blockchain. Like you saw the first gen happen with things like Twitch and Twitch, not Twitch. Um, it was like a Ethereum clone on, uh, sorry, a 
Twitter clone on Ethereum. Mm -hmm. um, you saw all of that happen in like 2017 to 20 time, 2020 timeframe, but none of it was like, I don't know. It just didn't, none of it worked. Um, you also saw the one uh, that was huge uh, where the, it was like founded by the base coin founders. I forget the name of it. But I think now we're starting to see some interesting social applications on the blockchain being built. And I really think that is the next wave that will happen. Like we saw NFTs, DAOs. I think social networks will probably be either the next thing or the next, next thing. Like things like Lens Protocol, who, which was created by the founder of Aave, is super interesting. They basically created a bunch of primitives for what all of a social graph consists of. And now developers can use those primitives to build interesting social applications. That's a, ne a good area to look out for social. next. Yeah. Yeah. It's about time. <laughs> I agree. I, th I think like a lot will a lot will become possible once the cost of transactions declines, and also when the cost of block space um, and storing things on chain decreases. Because right now there's still relatively few activities that people are doing on chain, besides yep. buying NFTs, like swapping tokens for each other. Like the richness of all of that interaction and the media that we're uploading to the internet still primarily happens on Web2 platforms. It's not on chain, which means that developers who are looking for new ways to facilitate discovery or facilitate interactions between users have not much to work off of in terms of underlying connections and content. Um, so I think like when we get to the point where the cost of block space declines and more of our activity can be um, stored on chain, then there will be like a proliferation of new social experiences um, to, to make sense of all of that information. Yeah, that's exactly right. And like, you know, in 2017, scalability was the big thing on people's heads um, because it's like, if we can't scale this thing, then there's no way it's going to be useful um, in, to the masses. But I think we've kind of gotten over that hump and if people finally have confidence that blockchains can scale, I mean, there's different trade-offs that people make to achieve that scalability. Some people make a trade-off in security, others in decentralization. Um, and I think people are starting to realize that scalability is like a very application-specific problem and maybe some applications need um, much more security, other applications can deal with less. And so we are try getting to that tail end of like, okay, scalability I think we've got we've got this. We, I think we can scale the blockchain. So now, all of the things like social stuff, I think, will 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 become a lot more easier for engineers to experiment. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, when we were building True Story, like I would have loved to build on Ethereum. Like, don't like, I love Ethereum. I think Ethereum is an amazing platform. But realistically, like, it was just impossible. Like, how are you going to build a social app, app in 2018 on Ethereum? That just doesn't make any sense. So we chose Cosmos because we can have much smaller transactions, but that also limited um, our, our connection to the broader ecosystem mm -hmm. because we were our own app chain and we had to like get adoption on that chain. Whereas like if you build on Ethereum, you can kind of piggyback off of the entire network effects of Ethereum, right. Right. which is huge. And now I think with Ethereum layer two stuff coming out and Ethereum eventually launching sharding, um, you'll see developers start building more um, day-to-day -day applications on Ethereum. I'm curious what sort of the steps that need to happen are or the timeline that most people expect for transaction costs to come down. Because yeah, I mean, if you have a social network where it costs, you know, 40 bucks of USD worth of gas, you know, for every post or every trend or every like or whatever, like every transaction, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty tough. Uh, you're not going to have people posting very, very much stuff. Um, so it needs to get down to like negligible, basically, transaction fees, like pretty close to zero for Bayview to happen at scale. I, I think it would be helpful to start with like what what is happening right now on Ethereum. Like yeah. we're at 32 million MetaMask accounts monthly, yeah. um, monthly active MetaMask accounts. And we're already hitting like the limitations of Ethereum in terms of transaction times, um, the gas costs for like minting an NFT are in the hundreds of dollars. Like, why is that happening, Preeti? Um, maybe you can sort of explain like what's happening right now and then the path out of out of where we are. Yeah. So, I mean, the reason Ethereum is so insanely expensive today is just because of the demand. And, you know, like you said, block space, right? It, there's only so much because everyone is storing, storing data on the Ethereum blockchain and transacting on this single blockchain. There's a limit to how much data and processing we can do on that blockchain. It's not like 
we have a thousand computers running these thousand applications, we have one computer running a thousand applications. So as a result, Ethereum charges a fee for every transaction and every piece of data that you store on the blockchain. And so if there's a lot of demand for the blockchain, then the, those fees go up because that's the only way they can kind of throttle the demand. And so that's why when NFTs blew up and DeFi blew up and all of these things blew up, um, the transaction fees just skyrocketed because everyone wants to transact. We're already seeing a way out of that. Um, the first iteration of us seeing a way out of that was Polygon. Polygon has been around for a couple of years now, but it really got popular last year. And um, Polygon is basically a side chain for Ethereum. A side chain is just basically an alternative blockchain that exists um, that can communicate with the Ethereum blockchain. So with Polygon, you can basically take your Ethereum, lock it up into a smart contract and buy the Polygon token and then transact on Polygon, which has much cheaper and faster transactions. And then when you're done, you can burn your Polygon tokens and then redeem your Ether. So Polygon is a side chain that exists on Ethereum and it gave people a, a platform to actually um, run much faster, cheaper transactions. So you saw a ton of applicants, almost like every major application on Ethereum move over to Polygon because it just it, it just made sense. It was, the, it was the only practical scalability solution that existed last year that actually worked. There are trade-offs to it. It's not like if you're transacting on Polygon, you know, it's not as secure, it's not as decentralized as Ethereum. So you're making a trade-off there, but application developers clearly didn't care. And now you're starting to see uh, rollups become more prominent or starting to become at least available for developers. Um, many of them are still very much in like alpha beta stage. There's like Optimism, Arbitrum, um, Starkware. They're all creating different flavors of rollups. And um, you can actually deploy on any application that you would deploy on Ethereum on a rollup today and, and already get much, much, much cheaper transactions. It's just that it hasn't been adopted as much as Polygon has. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think in the next six months, um, when these rollup solutions move out of that beta phase, um, a lot more developers will start deploying on rollups. And rollups are really the, the scalability solution that, for example, Vitalik and the Ethereum core community is really embracing. Like they, Vitalik, I think he appreciated Polygon, but he, viewed, he didn't view it as like the ultimate solution for scaling Ethereum. It existed, it, it met the need at the time, but he thinks like rollups are and sharding, which is another Ethereum scalability solution, are gonna be the ultimate solutions. So rollups are already gonna be available. Um, I think this year you'll see a lot more adoption of rollups, which is super exciting. And then I think sharding is the next thing. That's still a little bit uncertain. Sharding has been in the works for Ethereum for a couple of years now, and they're still very much in development phase. I think it's at least another one to two years out before we see any kind of adoption there. But at least in the interim, we do have rollups. Yeah. I'm curious, like, why doesn't it work like normal things? Like, let's say apples. If there's some company that, like, has an apple orchard and they get crushed with demand, everybody wants their apples, then, like, two things are going to happen. They're going to plant more trees and grow more apples. And then other people are going to be like, shit, people want apples. So let's, like, get in the apple business, right? Because the price signal encourages more supply to come online. It's like surge pricing with Uber. It gets more drivers to come online. Why isn't it as simple as that? Like, why can't Ethereum just, like, be like, wow, we're getting crushed with demand. Let's like buy some more EC2 <laughs> instances and like throw it on the network. Or like, I mean, I, I'm sure this betrays a basic misunderstanding of how it works, but I just want to ask the stupid question because it seems like, why is it so complicated to like scale, you know? Sure. Um, that's a good question. So the reason it is, is because remember in a decentralized network like Ethereum, every single node, so node is basically a computer that is participating in this network. Mm -hmm. um, every single node has to store the full copy of the blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, there are ways to kind of compress and prune old data that might not be necessary, but for the most part, you do have to store most of the data. And so if we make the blockchain too big, then anyone, for someone to become a node in the network, um, at least a full node in the network, they would have to get a much larger computer, like you said, like an EC2 instance or even a much larger one than that. And sure, we can say, let's, let's make that trade-off and make that a requirement for every node, but then that reduces the decentralization because you have far less people running full nodes. Because if you just made it so that, so that any person with a Mac laptop can run the Ethereum blockchain, then you have much more people who are willing to run the blockchain. But if you require them to have hardware requirements, then there's much less people running the blockchain, hence it's much more centralized because far yeah. few nodes are running. 
But I mean, how hard is it? Like, can you buy a computer on AWS that's big enough to be able to run a node? Yeah, if you if you you can use AWS to run the Ethereum blockchain today. It's not um, on a Mac. It's really hard. <laughs> It'll sure, take you yeah. days to sync the blockchain. It'll be really hard. But on AWS, you can. But how many people actually have knowledge of AWS? And how many people are willing to spend that money rather than just being able to run it on a laptop? I mean, the goal has always been like, can we even get people to run a blockchain on mobile phones? Like that was Balaji's first company, if you remember. He wanted people to be able to run a node on their computer. So we're trying to go in that direction, not increase the hardware requirements. But with that said, there are blockchains that are willing to make that trade off. And Solana is an example. Um, Solana, actually, to be a validator in Solana, you actually have to have pretty hefty hardware. So they are a little bit centralized, and that's how they get the higher throughput. Gotcha. So I guess is it economical right now to like? Because obviously AWS costs money in a in a very different way than if you like actually are pretty vertically integrated and own your own hardware and have access to like cheap electricity because you're sitting on like you know a dam or whatever um, or like a windmill farm. Is it economical to run an AW or a, yeah an, an Ethereum node on AWS? Or the reason why people aren't because I mean. There's not that many people who know how to do it, but there's like a lot. There's like hundreds of thousands of developers who like know how to do it. And so if it's economical, you'd think more people would. It depends. It depends because like Ethereum is still on proof of work. It's not on proof of stake. So with proof of work, the, the more hardware that you have, the more computing power that you have, the more um, likely that you are actually able to solve the proof of work puzzle. So you, it becomes more economic economical for you. Uh -huh. It's probably not very economical for an average Joe to just spin up and become a validating node on Ethereum. But, it, you know, it's not just about becoming a valid, a miner or a validating node. It's also about like, if we want decentralization, if we truly want everyone to own their data, then rather than me trusting a hundred other developers to store the blockchain, like I should be able to store the blockchain on my computer and have access to the transaction data and validate it on my computer without having to trust someone else to validate it for me. Does that make sense? Um, so like from a, from a decentralization ethos perspective, the goal has always been, let's get as many people running a node as possible because then the data is right there and they can validate everything themselves. How many people actually want to do that? I'm not sure. <laughs> right. I think like yeah. worst, the worst world is one where it's pretty centralized and it's super expensive and not very many transactions are happening. Better than that is like, okay, it's not quite as decentralized as we would like, but at least transactions are cheap because there's like, you know, hundreds of people with these large AWS instances or their own server farms or whatever. And at least we can like get the throughput without necessarily decentralization. We're like, And then the best is it's cheap and it's super decentralized. And yes. it seems like... Uh, to me, it's sort of like uh, if there's a profit opportunity in being a validator, then it seems like people should have done it. And but I'm since they haven't because the prices are so high, then I guess there's not an opportunity. Is like my outside view conclusion, but like I don't know. But it's very yeah. interesting to me because it seems like everything is being held back by transaction fees right now. Yeah, no, it's it's a really good point. Some people like Ethereum is taking the more like we want to be more decentralized route, and they have a very decentralization ethos. And there's a lot of more practical minded people who are like, I'm fine, think certain parts of the stack being more centralized. Um, and if I can get faster transactions and still get some of the guarantees that I would get on a regular blockchain. Yeah. So it's, 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 it comes down to philosophy at some point. Yeah, I, I think, um, so there was recently a piece that was going around the Twitter sphere, which it was probably like the best written piece of criticism on Web3 to date that I've at least come across. And that was a blog post by Moxie Marlin Spike called um, My First Impressions of Web3. I think Moxie is a founder um, of Signal, the application, the, the messaging yes. application. And he basically um, details a lot of his impressions and critiques of Web3, saying that even if the underlying blockchain is decentralized, there's still layers of the stack that are recentralizing. For instance, like in order to access data on the Ethereum blockchain, most developers of applications are actually using like one of a very small number of providers in order to connect to that underlying blockchain data, or they're just... Um, plugging into an API that's offered by OpenSea in order to access like data about NFTs and surface that to users. And so I, yeah, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that piece um, because I think part of the um, sentiment and the worry on the part of a lot of people is that Web2 started with a lot of the same ethos as well. People thought that the internet, you know, at the dawn of the 2000s would result in a flourishing of opportunities and 
everyone could operate their own website and monetize freely. But instead, we ended up having an ecosystem of a small number of walled garden platforms that have accrued most of the value. And so what are the countervailing forces that is to prevent Ethereum from becoming that as well? Yeah, so Moxie made really good points in that article. And I'll, I'll point to the two examples you, to- you said, which is um, one example he pointed to is a lot of developers, instead of running their own nodes, like we were just talking about, they will rely on services like Infura or Alchemy or any node provider to run the node for them. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's the centralization check choke point where you have centralized companies that are running nodes that you use as a developer. And then the other um, big criticism he had was, for example, OpenSea. Like, even though all the NFTs existing on the, exist on the Ethereum blockchain, open, most people use OpenSea um, to transact, and OpenSea has like a lot of control, and they are centralized, etc. The key thing I think that's missing from that argument, like, they're good arguments, they're good observations, is that on Web3, all the data is still stored on the blockchain. And then you have centralized players that exist that are serving users through the data that exists on the blockchain. With Web2, the centralized players exist and they have their own proprietary database. And so you don't even have, say OpenSea exists today, but if anyone wants to create a decentralized alternative of OpenSea, which is already starting to happen, looks rare, um, and a couple other teams are working on decentralized versions of OpenSea, they have that option to do that because they can just plug into the Ethereum database and pull the same data that OpenSea has access to. You can't do that on Web2. Like you can't yeah. access Facebook's data to create an alternative to Facebook. Yeah. So that's like that's huge. And I think yeah. when you miss that nuance, like you're just kind of looking at what the user sees on OpenSea, but you're not looking at like how the data is actually structured. Totally. Like Twitter, I think, is a great example where there was a whole developer ecosystem in the early days of like Twitter clients and bots and and all sorts of different stuff. And people were talking about it like it's a new sort of protocol, you know, and then Twitter, it just didn't fit their business strategy anymore. I don't really begrudge them for doing it because it's not like Twitter's been like the amazing performing stock of the decade or whatever. Like they had some tough choices to make, um, you know, thanks to just like the incentives of, of, of you know, what they set themselves up to do. And um, so all that went away, you know, like there's still some remnants of stuff from that era, like TweetBot still exists. I think they're sort of like, you know, got to keep their special deal with Twitter or whatever, because they had achieved a certain status. But most of those things went away. Whereas if somebody's relying on OpenSea's API and OpenSea decides to try and change it, it'll be very easy for someone else to come up and say, well, we'll expose this API in the way that people want, because at the end of the day, the data is not open seas. They can't really control it. They can only provide a more convenient form of access to it for some people. Yeah. And to the extent that they're aligned with that, then you know they will have traffic flowing through them, but they don't actually really have power. The power is really in the Ethereum network. Well, I, exactly. I would push back against that. I, I think that people are building network effects on top of the open data, and that network effect still accrues value and will serve as a source of defensibility, even if the underlying tokens are Ethereum tokens. So for OpenSea's example, like their order book is closed. It's proprietary mm. to their platform. So all of the bids and asks and offers that are on, on different um, NFTs, like that is OpenSea specific, right? And like other developers don't have access to that. And so it's still like a Web2 kind of traditional network effect that is still going to be powerful so long as users are using OpenSea and perpetuating that network effect. Yeah, that's a fair point on the order book piece. But I do think that OpenSea still has skin in the game to be more user friendly because they still don't own the NFT data. And so like, even if you look at, for example, the take rates of OpenSea versus like, I don't know, a Web3 platform like Apple, like OpenSea's take rate is like 2%, um, Apple's is 30%. So like, they have an incentive to serve and be on the user side because they know that the data is portable. I agree with that. Yeah, it'll definitely be really interesting to see how this plays out. Like, I, I think about the question of defensibility in Web three a lot because, uh-huh. yes, as an investor, like we have to think about that. And I, I, there are still going to be sources of traditional network effects defensibility, yeah. um, even yeah. if like the underlying blockchain is open. It's interesting because it seems really misaligned with like the basic ethos though. Like it's kind of like this core tension in any of these businesses. Like, um, you know, if you're a media company and you 
you know, subsist based on advertising, there's always a tension between the wanting to be credible and serve your audience and focus on, on what they want versus like, you know, shilling products, which is not necessarily inherently bad. Like we do advertising now and it's great and I love it because we have a nice subscription business that makes advertising business pretty much like optional, you know? Um, but like, it seems like for OpenSea, it's in their incentive to basically push it as far as they can to have more and more data and valuable stuff be like within their network, right? To like enhance their network effect. But that's like a sort of misaligned incentive with the with the users participating in their network. And so they're able to push it a certain amount, but they can only push it so far. And I think yeah. we'll probably see a lot of companies like flirt with a line basically um, in the same way that media companies kind of flirt with a line of figuring out how do you embed ads in ways that, uh, you know, basically are feel unobjectionable to people, but like, you know, track you as much as possible, uh, like, you know, are, are snuck in as like a native advertisement as much as possible, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, it's it's a super interesting thing to think about, like the defensibility in Web3, where do the, net, where do the network effects accrue? Stereotypically, like data is what gave you the network effects, but um, now you don't have that. So you uh, are you like, maybe it's additional layers of data on top of the core data that your accrue network effects on, or it's the user experience, whatever it is, um, I think it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. And my my thing is like, there's going to be centralized players in Web three, um, but now you have a choice um, and the ability to switch from platforms much more easily than you could on Web two. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, um, I want to end with uh, recommendations from you. So you know, this has been a whirlwind tour of Ethereum for folks who are seeking to develop a deeper fundamental understanding of Ethereum. Do you have recommended books, articles, resources um, that you could recommend to our listeners? Yeah, so obviously you can read the How Does Ethereum Work blog post that I wrote. I also actually really love, if you just go on ethereum.org, they have a bunch of guides and explainers of various topics related to Ethereum that I find really, really well written. It's like, it's not too technical. It's not, it's actually not that technical. But if you want to go into the technicals, they provide additional resources. So I would definitely check out just ethereum.org um, itself. And if you're a programmer, then you can do more like development-oriented stuff. You can join our DAP camp. There's also free um, educational resources like Build Space and Questbook that exist for developers. If you're not a developer, I would say like check out Rabbit Hole. I know that they have some really cool like things that you can do to get familiar with Ethereum and the best way I found to learn anything in the space is really just to get your hands dirty, like get a MetaMask wallet, um, try to transact on Uniswap, try to use Aave, um, try to buy an NFT, try to sell an NFT, and, and just try doing stuff. And then it'll just make things click a lot faster for you rather than trying to read and make sense of things. And then you can go back after you play around and read things and those things will start to make more sense to you and you'll want to dig deeper into it. Yeah, plus one to all of that. I definitely endorse like playing around with these applications, um, buying an NFT, like playing around with some of the DeFi products um, in order to get a better sense of how it works. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Preeti, for being on our show today. This has been awesome, really, really helpful, and I think really well explained. Um, where can people find you on the internet if they want to follow you and read more from you? Awesome. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. So my username is I am underscore Preeti. And yeah, that's probably the best place to reach out to me if you want to reach out. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been great.